can't see behind me. I, I guess I wasn't smart enough to not put it on my belt where I can't take it off and I can't see, so, you know. It's all right. It's my training, on-the-job training, right? Got to learn the little things. Amen. All right. Yeah, Christian is, Kristen, sorry, Christian. Kristen is, uh, was sharing with you guys about uh, truth, and I think it's important in a time today um, and, and what we'll see a little bit today about truth. I read some interesting facts. I'm going to share them with you today. Uh, let me pray this morning so that the Lord um, use me, guide me, and uh, allow me to be used uh, for his glory. Okay, Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this day, God. I thank you for opportunity to speak, Lord, an opportunity to be here, an opportunity to dive into your word and share the things that you showed me, Lord. I'm so grateful for um, the opportunity to, to be in a place where we can openly share and study God's word, Lord, and that nothing hinders us but our own self from coming to a place and, and a community and, and, uh, and partaking in worship together and partaking in uh, learning from your word, Lord. Please use me, Lord. Use uh, everything that I do from what I say to my mannerisms, Lord, and everything that uh, you've taught me uh, throughout this week, Lord, or these couple weeks, Lord, and I just pray that uh, it be a blessing to all of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, and this morning um, we're going to continue that journey in 2 Peter, and as you, I, I just want to remind everybody, the overall theme of 2 Peter, or the overall theme of our message is true knowledge, true knowledge, truth, right? Um, Peter is writing in his context uh, because truth is being challenged. In the context of where he's writing to, he's, you know, remember 1 Peter was about challenges really from the outside, and this is more about challenges from the inside of the church, what we would call believers, and, and questions. And, and the truth is that, simply put, I, I don't believe that Christians had, had defined as they get further and further away from the teachings of Jesus, from Jesus walking on the earth with them, as they get further from that event called the crucifixion, right, and the resurrection, and all the things we see in the book of Acts, as they get further away, um, different interpretations of the truth begin to develop. And isn't it like us to do that, right? As humans, we like to, you know, have different interpretations. The further I get away from a story I want to tell back in the days, right, it, it, it changes sometimes. My wife corrects me, oh, that didn't happen. I don't remember it like that, right? <laughs> and, you know, it changes because we forget, right? Some of it is innocent. We forget and we tell a different story. But some of it, I believe, is because we get in the way of ourselves, okay? And a lot of times we, we, um, we consider ourselves smarter than we are and we feel like we have this new revelation, right? And we want to share it with everybody. And then all of a sudden we're teaching things that are not true. And that's what was happening there, right? And there's a group much later in the next chapter, I think Pastor will cover, that he's really addressing, and it's a group called the Gnostics, okay? And we're not going to get into that. But I guess what today what I want to do is I want to ask you, how do you define truth? How do you define truth? Okay? How do you define truth? Now, let me tell you something. I've been in the grocery stores, and I've seen these books rich in truth and knowledge called tabloids. Right? We've all been there. We've all seen the stories in there. Right? The weird stories. Man delivers baby. Right? You know, uh, things like that. Right? Things that are just strange to us. Right? How do we know that's not true? How do we know that's not true? How do we know that the Bible's true and, that's, and, and that the Bible's true and that's not? Or that that's true and the Bible's not? How do you know? How do you define truth? Okay, here's some interesting facts. And, and let me tell you something. Uh, we, I laugh about the tabloids, but I'll be honest with you. Our young people today, they get their truth somewhere else. It's called influencers. They're called influencers on YouTube. They're constantly trying to follow and mimic what they do. They're constantly trying to follow. You know, I, I get in constant arguments with my son sometimes because he's like, that's not what th that is. And I'm like, yes, it is. Who told you that? Somebody on YouTube, right? Influencers. Influencers are, are huge in our society today. And for young people, they are at the top of the list of where they get their truth. Okay? 
where they get their truth. You just need to know that. We laugh about the tabloids, but the reality is the tabloids have come to life in what we call the internet. Now, I'm not trying to bash the internet. I love the internet. The internet's a great source, right? But many of you will search Google before you search your Bible for answers. Let's be honest. Where do we get our truth from? Here's a true story. This week in Bible class, we were talking about dualism, specifically the dualism that exists in the church, teaching that the body is separate from the spiritual, right? And the dangers that come with teaching that, this dualism, of, this, dualism this separation of the body and the spirit, right? And the dangers that come with that. And I asked the kid, do you know what dualism is? And the kid quickly picked up his phone and said, Siri, what's dualism? <laughs> it was hilarious. It made me laugh. And it fit perfect with my message. I was thinking... He's asking Siri for the truth, right, for some factual thing, because that's the world they live in. They have information at the palm of their hand. I'm not saying it's truth. It's just information. We do the same, though, as adults. We laugh at them, but we go to Google before we go to the scriptures, right? Now, I'll be honest with you. I'm going I'm to be totally honest with you. I go to Google a lot of times to find scriptures because in many ways I've gotten a little lazy about going through my Bible. And I, I type in the beginning of the verse, right? I did that today, this morning, because I, I wanted to add a verse at the last minute to my message. And I said, where is this verse found? I type in part of the verse. Thy word is a lamp unto my... And then, boom, I hit enter, and it comes out. It tells me where it's at. It's awesome, too. The Internet's awesome, okay? But we cannot let it replace God's word. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. So where do we get our truth? How do we define truth? Peter's facing the same question. People are challenging the truth of Jesus, Jesus, Gnostics, their big point is that Jesus is not really the Son of God. Right? Let me tell you something. We're hearing that today, in today's society too. Right? People question that. I had a question this week also as we were discussing dualism. A kid raised their hand and said, Pastor, how do you know which is the right faith? Who's telling the truth? It's an honest question. And I stopped and I said, you know what, that's an awesome question. And we're going to spend some time talking about that. That's what I told them. And so, it's, and I believe that every believer in search for truth encounters that same question. How do I know the Seventh-day Adventists don't have the right doctrine? How do I know that uh, the Pentecostal Charismatic Church down the street doesn't have the right doctrine? How do I know Catholicism isn't the right doctrine, right? How do I know what is truth? What is true? And so we need to establish some of those things, and it needs to come from Scripture, and we'll do that today. Okay? But here are some interesting facts that I found out on the concept of absolute truth. Okay? A study was done by the CRC, Christian Research Center of Arizona, who's trying to um, get some, some worldview concepts done, and they did a research study on truth. And this says, despite 72% of evangelicals identifying God as a source of truth, only 72% of evangelical Christians. At first I thought, okay, 72%. And then I said, only 72% of evangelicals identify God as the source of truth? I mean, that's pretty low, I guess. I would expect 100%, right? If you're believing in God, why would you believe that only, why would only 72% of us believe that? Right? 46 of those people per percent reject absolute truth, while only 40, well, those numbers are wrong, while only 54% accept it. This concept of absolute truth. Similarly, 69% of born again Christians point to God as a source of truth, but only 43% embrace a standard of absolute truth. Man, if believers do not believe, that God is the source of absolute truth, then we have a problem. Okay? That's why the, 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 pew, the chairs, the pews, they're empty. Because we ourselves, who are supposed to be, and I'm, I'm going to use the word selling it, because I'm going to give an example of me in the bank. I always scored low on my sales. Always. I had a hard time telling people to get something that I didn't have. Because I couldn't talk about it. And so I, I scored really high on these other marks on other things like, you know, customer service and, and, you know, my cash register accuracy and all this other stuff. But when it came to sales, I always stunk because I couldn't sell what I didn't believe in. Okay? And I'm, that's why I'm going to use the word sell that. 
If you don't believe that God is the source of truth, then you cannot sell that God is the source of truth to people. That's just a reality. And that's, those are numbers for today. Now, I, I want to liken that to Peter's time because I think in Peter's time, um, they didn't have the completed word yet like we have. They didn't have completed Bible where they can go to. They didn't have that yet. They had documents. They had circulating letters, but they didn't have the completed Bible yet. What we call the canonized Bible. They didn't have that. And so I give them a little more slack, I guess, for them to not understand what truth is yet. Right? I think it's, it's natural human tendency to say, well, it's common sense. People will get it. I think it's common sense that if you believe in God, then you should believe that he is the source of absolute truth. Right? And here's another question, because this is why the Bible is offensive to people. Because Jesus, if there was ever a statement ever made about truth, an absolute, an absolute thing, right? Because some people just have a problem with absolutes, right? But here's the thing. Let me give you a verse. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Okay? Is that an absolute? Absolutely. No other way. No questioning it. Don't even think about it. Only one way. That's offensive to some people. There's got to be more ways. How could God, a loving God, allow people to go to hell? That was a question that was brought up in my Bible class too. Real good questions, right? We got into some topics, and I think one of the girl, young girls says, why would God allow a miscarriage to happen, right? Those are real questions that we face all the time. But if you don't have a foundation of truth, and you don't understand, and you don't know where the source of truth is at, then you're going to go search online for other things. You're going to look at emotional well-being things, and there's nothing wrong with them, okay? There's nothing wrong with them. I believe God gave us the sciences, and God gave us medicine and psychology, all those, all those fields of study. God gifted that to us so that we can help each other improve ourselves, right? But ultimately, I also believe that the ultimate source of, of hope, the ultimate source of understanding is found in Scripture. Right? It's found in Scripture. Now, these other areas of study, they're great for like understanding how the mind works, understanding where some of these maybe discouragement or depression is coming from, understanding yourself, teaching you about yourself, but ultimately the source of hope comes from God's Word. Right? That's the ultimate thing. And so I'm making these statements right now, but how do you know that's true? How have you what are some standards that you've developed to know what's true and what's not true? It's very important for us to understand. Very important for us to understand. Okay? Let's read our scripture for this morning. Today my prayer is that as Peter explains the reasons and sets the foundation for why his message of the Son of God is truth and... His word is true. My prayer is those of you that have not completely answered this question for yourself or those that have wrestled with this question can answer it today. Okay? So we are in 2 Peter chapter 1, 16 through 21. It says, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were witnesses, eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this, beloved, my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased, that's a quote, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. He's talking about a specific event found in the book of Matthew, found in the book of Luke, called the Transfiguration event, and we'll get into that a little bit, okay? It says, uh, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes 
from someone's own, excuse me, turn the page here, so, someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Dear God, Lord, I thank you for your word, Lord. I thank you for the clarity of your word. I thank you for how it speaks to us today, Lord. And I pray, Father, that we are able to answer the question of truth as Peter describes in the word of God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So Peter opens up immediately, immediately by addressing this idea that Jesus is not a myth. That Jesus is not a myth. Okay? Now, what I take from that immediately, and it's not necessarily part of your notes, and your notes are a little different today. I only have two sections of it, so it's not a lot of filling out. But at the end, I will challenge you to, to write down some things on the back uh, when you go home today. And so as we talk about this, because one of the key components of today's uh, message is to share your story. Okay? Share your story. So we'll get to that right now. But he, he begins his argument by saying, hey, Jesus is not a myth. And this is what I want to share with you, okay? Any kind of defense of what you believe needs to start with Jesus. It needs to begin with Jesus saying, Jesus, let me tell you why. Because without Jesus, if Jesus is not really the son of God, then his death on the cross is meaningless. And that is the foundation of our belief, right? That he is the son of God, that he is worthy and capable of taking on our sins for the rest of our life, for the rest of time, and the sins that have already happened. And he is that sacrificial lamb. That is the foundation of our story. If you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, then you are lost and you are wasting your time because that is the foundation of yours and mine's salvation. Okay? So he begins his argument by trying to address that. Now he's addressing these two issues, I believe, because they are at the core of what they were facing at that time. And this Gnostics, these Gnostics at the core, at the very core of their belief, didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Okay, and you'll learn about them next week, but he just didn't believe. So he's addressing that Jesus is the Son of God. And the second part of this, of this his message is, he is he's addressing that, that, is, uh, uh, um, that because he is the Son of God, that he is validation that the Word of God is true. That's what he's saying. Two parts to this whole section. That Jesus is the Son of God without equivocation. And there's reasons for that. He establishes parameters, okay? And that because he is the Son of God, in the personhood of Jesus, that the Bible is true. The Word of God is true, okay? And so we need to, we need to understand what he's trying to say. So he be, begins by saying, hey, I am going to testify. He's going to give a testimony basically, in that first section, right? He's going to begin a testimony about what he witnessed, okay? What he witnessed, all right? And there are two things that he addresses. These are the parameters of how you know Jesus was real, okay? How you know God's word is real, too. It's the same parameters, okay? The first part of the parameters are from your personal experience. He's going to share his personal experience, what he physically saw, a lot of us as Christians, we struggle connecting the dots. I try to be kind of, kind, of, kind of fancy in putting this like connect the dots thing because that's what I was thinking. A lot of us struggle with connecting the dots in our lives. When something happens, we say, oh, man, I was lucky. Instead of saying, man, the Lord was with me. Amen? We need to connect the dots in our everyday lives. Laura's story, like she just shared right now. That is a story of God's evidence in his life. I share with the Sunday school class about how God, you know, brought us through this buying this house thing, right? And how it was just these weird circumstances that led us to that. But we can point to it and say, man, that was the Lord. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't luck. It wasn't good circumstances. I wasn't in the right place at the right time. It was God's divine guidance. Okay, and I can share with you countless the time when our car flipped over uh, when we were going across the freeway, we got hit by a car and it spun and it flipped over. I can share with you over and over things on where the Lord was with me. That's in my life. That's my personal experience. Right. I can share that with you. Each one of you need to learn to connect those dots. How is God working in your life? Because eyewitness account is one way we verify truth. 
I'll give you an example. Ron will understand. I got robbed at a bank three or four times. Not me personally. I was a banker. Okay? And they came in. One time it was like guns blazing. Okay? It was like a movie. Now I can laugh about it. Then I was scared. Okay? And they came pistol whipping people and all this other stuff. Another one was a little different. It was my first day on the job. And we got robbed. But that's not the point. I can tell you the story. It's after that. When the police came, when we called in the robbery, they said, okay, everybody isolate yourself. Don't talk about anything. When we get there, we're going to want to interview every individual person. Why do you think? So the story doesn't change, right? So that people are not like, you know, I did backflips and, you know, we were all doing all this other stuff. And, you know, so the story doesn't change so that, so that they can identify what is the truth, what really happened. They take eyewitness account and they take video and they take all the, the survey, all the, the evidence in the place, right, to figure out what really happened. It's not much different than when we discipline kids in school. Right, Pastor? Yes. We got to bring in all the kids in. What happened? And then a new name comes up. Oh, they got to come in too. And then a new name, oh, they got to come in too. And then we, we try to come to what the truth really is because oftentimes the truth is different from everybody's perspective. Right? Okay? And we have to come up with our best guess of what the truth is after we get all the evidence in front of us, right? Eyewitness account is one way we verify truth. That's called personal experience. Okay? Personal experience. And we'll talk a little bit because some people will accuse Christians, well, that's just your truth. That's what happened in your life. Right? You're just crazy. Right? That doesn't make it true. Right? And they bounce around. And I think in, Christ in the Christian world, we also accept that as, as acceptable. But it's not. God's word is absolute truth. Right? And if our stories, our personal experiences are consistent with God's word, We'll talk a little bit about consistency. It's another way to establish truth, right? Consistency of God's word. Then we can probably say, hey, your experience is probably true. Probably really happened. I've never experienced that, but it's awesome that you have. Right? Right? And so that is what we're talking about here. We need to be able to set some parameters. The second one that he's going to do is he's going to say, hey, I just mentioned it right now. Scriptural verific verification on fulfillment. One of the ways that they can tell that Jesus is true is that there's scriptural verification, right? And we'll talk a little bit about that when we get there, right? Scriptural verification. So let's go back to the text real quick. For we, if you underline your book, underline circle we. We is very important, okay? For we, he's not, it's not just me. It's not just for I. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths. Who are the we that he's talking about? It's him and all the disciples. They're getting killed for this faith. So obviously they believe it's true. Right? And he's saying, we didn't do this. We didn't follow these like myths. Right? It's not something we just heard and we just decided to follow. Okay? <clears throat> when we made known to you, again, we, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Okay? For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves, we ourselves heard this very voice, born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. Who is this we? Well, let's turn over to uh, Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through, through I think we'll read up to, through 8, right? One through eight. This is not a single person testifying to the power of Jesus, okay? Because when that happens, that can be easily construed as that person is just crazy. They're off their rockers. They lost their marbles, you know, whatever, right? But when it's we, when it's several people having the same eyewitness account, then we can probably give it more credence, right? Police officers have a hard time because they, they arrive at the scene usually way after something has happened. Is that correct, Ron? And they have to be puzzle solvers. They take all the notes they can. They ask all the questions that they've been trained to ask because they're trying to determine what really happened. What is the facts? How do we write this report to reflect what factually happened with us not really seeing it? Eyewitnesses, right? Eyewitnesses. Share your stories. I'm going to say that a couple of times. Share your stories. We collectively, as we share our stories, we are bringing 
evidence and affirmation that Jesus is real. But if you keep your story into yourself, I don't care if you're embarrassed, afraid, scared, whatever. If you keep your story to yourself, then we are not doing, are not testifying of Jesus. We're allowing people to lump Jesus in with all these other prophets. Right? And so I want to challenge you. Share your story. I told that to the kids. Well, it was one of my questions on one of my quiz because we, we, walked, we talked about Paul's testimony in Acts chapter 20, 26. And half the kids didn't fill out their testimony because they didn't know what it was. Dad. And I would say many of those kids do go to church and they still didn't know what the testimony was. Right? I, I don't know. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. But can you share your testimony? Can you testify of the journey that God's brought you through? Can you testify of his goodness, like we sang today? The evidence, right? These songs that we sing in church, they're not just to sing because they sound cool, and we have beautiful singers up here, and they're singing great, right? They get much beautiful, more beautiful when I'm not on stage. I noticed that. I don't know why. The camera does something, I guess, when I get on here. No. But, you know, they, they sing their songs not because they have beautiful voices or any of that stuff. It's because we're trying to sing biblical truths of what's, of, that's what worship is. We are worshiping God and we're singing his praises. Right? That's why we shouldn't be quiet when we're singing. We should be loud. We should be excited. It should be an outpouring of everything that God has done in our lives. You know what I mean? That's what it should be. It shouldn't be just standing here, you know, kind of like dull. I mean, I get excited when I start thinking about some of the things God has done in my life. I get excited about it, right? That excitement should come through, all right? And so I just want to encourage you, share your stories. Share your stories. And so he goes back and he says, we did not follow cleverly devised myths. That's what they were being accused of. That this Jesus who died on the cross and rose again, that's what they would say. That's, he's not really the son of God. He was just a man. He died. Somebody robbed him, robbed the tomb, right? We've heard a lot of these weird, you know, stories, right? They just robbed the tomb, man. That wasn't real. He wasn't Jesus. He wasn't the son of God. He can't be. We're still waiting for the, the Messiah to come, right? There was a whole lot of theories out there, and they were accusing them of following these cleverly devised myths. Now, when I think of myths, I think of Greek mythology, okay? And these incredible stories in Greek mythology. Medusa, right? Medusa was this beautiful woman, had gold hair. You know, there was some jealousy issue that happened. She got changed and she got snakes in her head, okay? And turns people to stone. Right? That's Greek mythology, right? Icarus flew too close to the sun. He failed. Right? We've heard these stories. Unbelievable stories. Why don't we believe them? Because there's no, there's no text. There's no eyewitness account of these things. They're just stories. And they were lumping the story of Jesus with these myths. Let me tell you, if you don't share your story, you're allowing that to happen too. Because we are the eyewitness account of Jesus. You see what I'm saying? And so we need to share our stories. We need to share our stories with, with our neighbors, with the person at McDonald's, with the waiter at the, I don't know, Miranchito, wherever you're going to go eat today, right? Uh, Merendero, some of you guys go to Merendero, right? With the, with the Sam's Club worker, with the gas attendant. Share your story with the people that you pick up the donuts with, right? Talk to them. Learn to share your stories, okay? <clears throat> Mythology is unbelievable stories with no verifiable eyewitnesses. Jesus certainly is not like Medusa. Why oh, I put Pandora in there, Pandora's box, right? We hear all these, all these lessons right out of these stories, right? Jesus was a real person, verifiable by both scripture and traditional historical texts. And eyewitnesses, right? <clears throat> Those that give an eyewitness account of his existence can, though, uh, can also be verified in scripture and traditional historical texts. Paul, Peter, these people, you can go back and track them in non-religious texts that they were real people. Okay? In the Bible, you can look at I love looking at the Bible, especially the Old Testament. And I, I got to sub a junior high class uh, recently. And they were in the, in the, um, <clears throat> they were in the story of, of um, uh, Darius 
and those kings and the Greek kings, right, the Persian Empire. And I was able to tell them, you know where that fits in the Bible? And we went into the book of Daniel, and we were able to look at where these kings kind of meshed with that because sometimes our kids can't, can't put together where the Bible fits in what they learn in school, okay? And some adults don't, can't put it together. But there are, there are <clears throat> points of time in Scripture that allow you to put that in time with what's happening and what they learn in, 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 their, in their history classes. It's important for us to make those connections. Paul was a real person, verifiable by historical text. <clears throat> Peter was a real person, <clears throat> verifiable by historical text, right? These people were real. Jesus was a real person, verifiable by historical text, right? So there is other texts outside of Scripture that say that they were real people. That's all evidence. That's all evidence, right? <clears throat> and so, but let me tell you what's not evidence, what's not the same, okay? The person of Jesus and the divinity of Jesus is real, and we cannot let others continue to lump him with other religious persons. Joseph Smith, right? What did they say? The prophet Muhammad? That's who they, that's who they consider, the world considers Jesus and his contemporaries. But Jesus was different. Muhammad died and never rose again. Joseph Smith died and never rose again. Their writings are, are con they, they consider them new prophecies, new revelations. But in God's word, it says that there's nothing going to be outside of that word, right? No new prophecies, nothing new, right? God already gave us everything we need to know. There's no need for a new revelation. Let me tell you, if Pastor Lincoln or myself stand up here and say, I found a new revelation, and we're going to all drink Kool-Aid, you know, next week, right? <laughs> then don't show up next week, okay? <clears throat> Find a place because we've lost our marbles, all right? There is no new revelation. All our, all our teaching should come from God's Word, right? Because that is all that's needed, okay? Let's move on in the text. Verse 17, for when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard the very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. Okay, now I had already asked you to turn to Matthew chapter 17, and this is where we're going to read it. Okay, this was the eyewitness account of what we call the transfiguration of Jesus. It's found in Matthew 17, 1 through 8, Mark 9, 1 through 9, and Luke 9, 2836. We're going to read Matthew's account, okay? It says, After six days, <clears throat> Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up. It's only three. I read that wrong. Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Not John and then the brother of James, okay? Sorry. My, I got to make sure I make that clear. And led them up a high mountain by themselves. Verse 2, there he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then, he, there he appeared before them, Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. This event happened. And, 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 it's, and he's saying, look, there were several of us there. Peter, James, John. Right? And you could throw in Elijah and Moses. Because they were there too. And they all saw the same thing. Okay? This is the we part, right? Going back to the we part. It's easy if one person came and said, man, I saw this vision. I saw this other stuff. It was in a big room. But I'm the only one that saw it. Well, that's weird. Right? But for all three to have the same account, there's the we part, right? For all three of them to have seen the same thing, now it becomes like, ooh, it might be real, right? I mean, we hear of those things all the time. 
I saw Jesus on a, on a tortilla. <laughs> right? Or the water fountain. Or the cloud. Right? And we hear all these stories all the time of people talking about how they see Jesus in different ways. Right? But it's only them and it's only one person. Now let me tell you. Either God specifically just wanted to speak to them, which is totally possible. But if that's the case, that's not for everybody else to talk about. Right? If God reveals something to me and only me, then it's for me. There are times, I've, I've shared this before, where I'm studying for a message and something I come across, I say, you know what? I don't know if that's for the congregation. I think that's for me. I better shape up in that area. You see what I'm saying? Because that's for me. I don't need to share with nobody else. But there are moments where, you know, when, if there was two or three people in a room and they were all praising Jesus and, you know, this is what, where we get the account of the book of Acts, right? Where there was a lot of people in this house and the rushing wind and all this other stuff. There was multiple eyewitnesses to this account. So we could say that's got to be true. Multiple pe people saw that. If in this room we had a similar experience, I'm not saying that we, we will, but I'm just saying if we had a similar experience, right? And everybody can testify that they, they saw the same thing and we all left out of here, then guess what? It might be true that it happened because everybody saw the same thing, right? If I slip and fall off these stairs, you all see it. You all go tell everybody that I slipped and fell off the stairs. Even if there was no video, people would probably say, Pastor Frank fell off the stairs. I missed it, <laughs> right? But if only one of you says that and everybody else is doing that, they'd call that one person a liar, right? That's how we establish truth, right? We establish truth, okay? And so let's go on. At the, at the transfiguration, Jesus was transformed in glory before the apostles, not merely changed in outward appearance, but the effect was so, was so extreme, Jesus became so bright in his appearance that it was hard to look at Jesus. He shined like the sun. That's what Matthew said. Okay? And then we hear this phrase, this is my beloved son coming from God himself. And all of them heard that. Verification that Jesus is real. That Jesus is real. Right? It's important that we can testify of Jesus. Share your story, brothers. Share your stories so that you can, so that people around us who are not sure that Jesus might be real can kind of get the deal that everybody has that experience of Jesus, right? Everybody, everybody's testifying different things in their lives, man. It might be real. This Christianity thing might be a real thing, right? Instead of them saying they're just myths, just stories they hear in a fake book. Right. The words from heaven clearly put Jesus above the law and the prophets. Jesus was not merely another or even a better lawgiver or prophet. Jesus was and is the beloved son. Amen. Right. He's not like a prophet. He wasn't just some other person. Even Moses, even Abraham, these people who came before him. Right. He wasn't. Jesus is real and we need to testify of him and the things that he's done in our lives. So let's go over to how do we know scripture is true? Verse 19, right? How do we know scripture is true? Okay. We know scripture is true because 19 begins by saying, where's my thing here? I didn't write it down. Uh, verse 19, let's see here. Let me go to the beauty of technology. See, here we go. Verse 19. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. We have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. Okay? That means that all the texts that existed before Jesus came and before they were ready, all the Old Testament manuscripts that prophesied of the coming Jesus, okay, it is now more fully confirmed than it was back then. Why? Let me share with you why. Just the mere coming of Jesus, he fulfilled at least 332 distinct Old Testament prophecies regarding the Messiah. 332. Okay, I got some, some, some mathematician facts here. There's a professor named Peter uh, Stoner. That's kind of a weird name, Stoner, right? Peter Stoner. 
has, he calculated the probability of any one man fulfilling just eight of these prophecies is one in one, I don't even know how to say that number. It's got like three, six, nine, 12, uh, 15, 16, 17 zeros after the one. Those of you that, and then it says, and 10 to the 17th power. That's a big number, <laughs> right? That's a big number. I don't think there's a name for that number. Just eight. For someone to fulfill just eight. He fulfilled 332. How much more concrete evidence do we need? And so by him fulfilling those, those prophecies, right? By him fulfilling what's in Scripture, he is more fully confirming the Word of God. Right? He has more completely confirmed than, than to the people in the Old Testament. Daniel and them didn't get to meet Jesus, right? They just spoke of him coming, and there was no confirmation of any of that really happening, right? But now that they're living in Peter's time, they're saying, hey, this Jesus who we're sharing with you is the Son of God. He fulfilled 332 Old Testament, distinct Old Testament prophecies, okay? So when someone asks you, is Jesus real? Oh, yeah. There's no other book in the Bible that he could have, you know, that, that could have, you know, that, could, that he could have confirmed, right? Is the Bible real? Absolutely. Because Jesus is part of that confirmation. Now, he's not the only thing we can point to. We can point to other things, right? How about the promises that are in Scripture in our lives? Here comes the eyewitness accounts, right? How do we prove? We're setting standards, right? Eyewitness account, personal experience, scriptural affirmation. It's hand in hand. That's how we develop truth. Okay? Eyewitness account, scriptural affirmation, right? So what about the, the, the evidence in your life? Does it speak to the truth of the scriptures? But share your story, right? If you don't share your story, no one's going to ever believe that the word of God is real. You are affirming testimonies of the truth found in Scripture. Amen? You and I, all of us who call ourselves Christians, right? We are affirming, okay? He also said that if you consider 48 of the prophecies, the odds become 1 in 10 to the 157th power. I don't even know what that number is. But man, that's amazing to me when I read that. That's amazing. I don't understand why people question God's word or the validity of Jesus. When those two facts together should give overwhelming evidence. We'll move on, though. 19b says, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises. Okay? Until the day, until the day dawns and the morning star rises. God's word is a lamp in a dark place. How many of you guys can testify to that in your lives? Okay, you've been in a dark place and you go to God's word and all of a sudden you find hope. If you haven't experienced it, I'm sad for you. It's nothing better to experience than to be in a dark place in your life. Whatever the circumstances are, it doesn't matter. Dark place in your life and go to God's word and be immediately washed with truth and immediately feel better about the situation. Nothing better than that. I'm here to tell you that, nothing better than that. And so that's why it's important for you to connect the dots. Connect the dots in your life, right? So what does that mean? Psalm 119 verse 10 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That really brings it to life, right? I, I, I woke up the other day, and I'm sure it's happened to all of you guys. I was looking for my cell phone for a light because it was all dark in the house, okay? And I couldn't find it, so I said, forget it. I can make it to the bathroom. And what happens? What do you think happens? No. Bang, my toe. I didn't know that my wife had moved something to the area where I, walk, where I normally walk, okay? And so, bang, I hit the toe, Right? 
All right. That verse became really real to me because, you know, I'm thinking if I had something that lighted my path, right, then things wouldn't happen. Right. Let me tell you something. If you allow God's word to light your path in the dark times of your life, then you will find your way. Okay. Google's great, but God's word is better. Don't be like that kid, Siri. <laughs> right? right away. Siri, what is this? Let me tell you something. I want to ask you that. Is God's word really a lamp unto your feet? Is he really a lamp unto your feet? I'm going to be honest with you, okay? When we talk about, about the spiritual war that exists, and that's not what the topic we're talking about, but it's real. The devil desires nothing more than for you to stub your toe, right, with life circumstances, okay? And let me tell you, the percentage of that happening greatly increases if God's word is not a light unto your path. It's not a lamp on your feet. It greatly increases. You might get lucky and get through there, right? But it greatly increases. And, and that's the truth of Scripture. For us believers, we need to share that with people. I share that with the young kids all the time. They say, but pastor, how do I draw closer to God? And pastor, I want to be blessed. And pastor, I want to do... And they talk about all these things. And I think they genuinely want those things. I really do. I believe they do. But then you've got to get to the hard part. You've got to let the Lord and his word guide your every step. And that's hard. It's hard for adults and it's hard for young people. Right? And so I get that. It's hard. But it's... But it's the best way. It's the best way. Okay? It illuminates our path in a dangerous and treacherous place. The devil wants us to fall and fail. Dangerous place, right? Until the day dawns and the morning star rises. Okay? The original phrase of that is really almost always used to describe the second coming of Christ. Okay, so basically what he's saying is uh, you would do well. It's in your best interest. You will live a better life. I'm going to give you all the different phrases of that. If you allow God's word to be the lamp unto your feet and the light of your path. That's what he's saying there. Until when? Until the return of Jesus. Until the return of Jesus. Forever. Right? Forever. Verse 20 and 21, no scripture is one person's own story. There's no, I, I, I can't stand with it. That's your truth. It's not my truth. Man, there's truth, okay? There's truth, all right? And that's found in scripture, right? Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture, this is verse 20, comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along in the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to be, be careful here because this version says prophecy of Scripture. I'm not talking about prophecy in general. Okay, it's very clear. Prophecy of Scripture. What's in God's word, the prophetic words in God's word is what he's addressing here. Okay, none of that was done by the man. In other words, Paul and Peter didn't sit down and say, you know, I'm going to... You know, 2,000 years from now, I'm going to write about something about God so that 2,000 years from now it could apply. And i got to study, and i got to do all this stuff. There are some great Christian books out there, but they, they plan what they're trying to accomplish, right? They're not thinking about the future. They're trying to think about what's my point? What am I trying to write about? It's the same, similar thing, okay? Similar thing. The only difference is that it's confirmation here that it was divinely given by the Holy Spirit. It says, as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So that means that as they're writing a letter, I, I can imagine this, this happening. The church call, writes to Peter or Paul and says, hey, man, we got some problems over here. We got these Gnostics, and they're over here talking trash about Jesus, and we just don't know what's true, man. Can you come and give a little conference, a seminar about what's really true? Because we don't know. We're all confused. So Peter says, okay, no problem. So he writes this little letter and tries to address those issues, right? But as he does that, as he's addressing the modern-day challenge that exists there, we talked about this yesterday in our Bible study class, right? There is a macro 
purpose of God, meaning an overall purpose of God. And I believe that oftentimes as he's working in me, he's going to bless all those around me as he blesses me. Because he's not just working in me. He's working in me, but for the benefit of everybody too at the same time. We just get so self-focused about me. I don't care about everybody else. I just want to know what's going to happen to me. Right? We get that way. And the truth is that as God works, he works in such a wonderful way. He works in a miraculous way. We were talking about that when it came to the story of Abraham. God was saving Abraham in that story from sinning against God because God had promised them a son, okay? And he, like a bonehead, for a second time gave his wife away as his sister. The, the king didn't know anything about it, right? And, when, and the king justly said, how am I going to get punished for this? Did he even lie to me? Like, I, I just took him at his word, right? In that story, if you want to read it, Genesis chapter 20, I believe, is where we were. Okay? And he's like, uh, that's not fair. How am I going to get punished? God says, return that wife. Yes, you're right. And I, and I worked to not let you touch her. So you haven't sinned against me. Return the wife, and he's going to pray for you basically forgive you and bless you, and then you will be healed. Your punishment will be taken away. God was working to save Abraham and Sarah from making another dumb mistake, micro, also working macro at the same time. Sometimes we forget that, right? Sometimes we forget that. I believe that there are some, and this is, and I want to say this carefully because sometimes people get messed up. I believe that the errors that we make in our lives, if we seek God and learn from them, he can use as examples so that future people can learn from them. That's what we do as parents, right? When we tell our kids, my dad used to say, nothing good happens in the night. I was like, what are we talking about? These ancient proverbs, my dad, you know? <laughs> but let me tell you something. I believe it. I believe it. Especially as a young person, nothing good happens at one in the morning. Go home. Get in your bed or you run the risk of putting yourself in trouble, right? Right? It's a truth. Why? Because my dad probably did some bad things in the middle of the night too. And he learned. And he's passing that wisdom to me. Why do I share that with other people? Because I did some bad things in the night too. Right? So now I believe nothing good happens in the night, right? Evidence, right? And that's what I always tell young people. Look, if your parents are telling you something, okay, I'm going to be honest with you. They probably did it and they knew that it's wrong. And now they're trying to keep you from making that same mistake. So listen to them. So listen to them, right? So what he's saying here is that no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, Okay? No prophecy in Scripture was produced by the will of man. All right? No prophecy. So I want to get to application real quick. Application, okay? Here's the application for today. Number one, you can be certain that believing in Jesus is truth. Okay? Not just because, you know, God said it, I believe it. What's that phrase that people say? God said it, I believe it. So... Huh? That settles it. Yeah. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Right? And, and sometimes that's great to say, but, you know, the truth is that, you know, we got to be able to explain ourselves, right? Sometimes people want evidence, right? And so we've got to be able to share that evidence with them, okay? And the second application is you can believe that truth is found in God's Word. Truth is found in God's Word. And here are the three reasons, right? It's truth because we've personally experienced it. Okay, it's truth because of scriptural affirmation and it's truth because of historical evidence. Okay, those are the three things that make something true. Right? Like when a kid says, I don't like broccoli. Have you tasted it? No. Well, how do you know? <laughs> right? I don't like asparagus. Have you tasted it? No. Well, how do you know? Because it's green. <laughs> That's not a reason. Right? I use those reasons too, brother. Trust me, I did too, right? But let me tell you, that's not, that doesn't make it true because of those things. We have to have parameters for truth, right? And those are the parameters that we can have. Those are the parameters 
that we can have. Let's close. I want the worship team to come up as, we, as I kind of give our closing remarks. Okay, I want to close today. I want you to close your eyes. Let me tell you something. I don't know where you're at. I don't know if some of you were wondering, how do I define truth? I don't know if you were ever even questioning if God's word were truth or Jesus. I think many of us accept Jesus by faith, and then we're learning and we're growing to learn about him. But I pray that, that wherever you were today, whether you were someone that was on the fence of Je about Jesus, or whether you were someone who was on the fence or had not an understanding of how to display the truth about God's word, I pray that God spoke to you today. I pray that you not be afraid to share your story. The promises that have been given in God's word and have been fulfilled in your life need to be told. And so I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you. Let me tell you, on a different topic, church growth happens because of that. It doesn't happen because you have an awesome pastor. It doesn't happen because you have a, a great visitation team. It doesn't happen because you have a great children's ministry. It doesn't happen because you have a great live stream. It doesn't happen because you have a great uh, worship team. All those are awesome things. A big building. It happens because people are out there sharing their stories with others, and they bring folks to the feet of Jesus. That's how church growth happens. And every person in here, from the youngest to the oldest, can play a part in that. Doesn't matter where you're at in life. Doesn't matter how much you know about Scripture. Because it's about sharing about your story. And no one knows your story better than you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Dear God, Lord, I thank you so much for this day, Lord. I thank you for these, the people that are here today, Lord. I thank you for their stories, Lord. And I pray, Father, that uh, we all learn something. Lord, I pray that if someone doesn't know Jesus today because they didn't believe, they didn't, weren't quite convinced that he was true, I pray that they have a different understanding today. And if that's so, Lord, I pray that as we sing this last song, they have the courage to come forward and accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Father, I also pray, Lord, that those of us that maybe don't share our story because we're shy or maybe we, that we understand that it is crucial for us to share our stories so that we can testify about God's goodness, about God's mercy, about God's guidance, and about the real person of Jesus and the saving work in our lives. Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity, and I pray for those people um, who may make a decision today. Thank you, Lord, for letting me speak today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So if you feel, as they sing today, if you feel the need to come forward, uh, Pastor Lincoln and I can pray with you. Uh, we'd love to do that uh, for whatever reason. All right? God bless you.